Picture this. The day is July 4th, 1795. A warm, sunny Saturday in Boston. And right out there on Milk Street, right out there between this meeting house and the home of Benjamin Franklin's youth, his home still standing in 1795, right out there are 15 white horses. The horses whinny and snort, scraping hoofs impatiently against the earthen lane, shifting in their harnesses, withers twitching, tails switching. The 15 white horses are being hitched together, 15, one for each state of the Union. Behind them, attached to the hitch, on a bed with wheels, is a time capsule. The time capsule is at the center and occasion of this ceremony. This day, the time capsule will be liver, delivered and installed within the cornerstone. desire a, a larger, more elegant structure. They ached for a structure to better represent the new country and the optimism of a new age of independence and self-rule. For the new state house, they chose a site up on Beacon Hill, the former site of John Hancock's cow pasture. Within the time capsule are many items, among them a nail from this meeting house, among them a tr pine tree shilling minted in 1652 by Old South founding member John Hull, the pine tree shilling of patriotic and rebellious reputation. It had been minted illegally, minted in defiance of the King of England, who ordered the mint closed the pine tree shilling symbolizing the brazen assertion of a young ragtag colony that they will not be ruled from across the sea. They will mint and produce their own coin of the realm, thank you, the coin of this realm. Also in the time capsule is a copper medal with George Washington's likeness. George Washington, the leader who would not be king, a powerful, charismatic leader who refused to amass power for himself, who refused a third term as president. At the stroke of noon, the fusiliers in dress uniform raise their rifles and commence a thundering, smoke-billowing 15-gun salute. As the smoke clears, the grand procession, as they call it, accompanied by fusiliers and pulled by 15 white steeds, begins. Oh, did I tell you? The grand procession is led by three most distinguished men. All three are clad in bright, crisp, ceremonial dress. First, the governor, who happens to be a member of this church, His Excellency Samuel Adams. Next, Paul Revere, Grand Master of the Masonic Lodge, whose famous ride was 20 years before. And third, Colonel William Scully, Colonel of the Boston Militia, the man after whom Scully Square would later be named, who happens to be a deacon of our church. The grand procession inches ever so slowly toward the site of the new State House ever so slowly because they are in no hurry at all. No hurry because the distance is not far. No hurry because the town means to savor this delicious moment. No hurry at all because it's not every day that 15 white steeds are hitched together and Adams, Revere, and Scully are decked out in state attire. No hurry because it's not every day that a time capsule is delivered to the new state house of a young, independent nation. In stately, measured progress, the grand procession winds its way through the narrow streets amid cheers, salutes, 
hat-waving, and huzzas. Eventually, the grand procession clops up Beacon Hill, arriving at the site of the new state house. The 15 white horses, their backs now foamy and slippery with sweat, are reined to a halt. Muscled men carefully offload the time capsule from its wheeled cart, carefully because the eyes of the governor and Colonel Scully and Grand Master Revere are on them. Carefully the men heave and lift and position the time capsule, then slide and coax it inside the awaiting cornerstone, and finally seal it shut with flanged sheets of lead. At the time the capsule is entombed and the cornerstone sealed, another crackling 15-gun salute heralds the deed. This is followed by more huzzas, cheers, and hat-waving. That's how important this building was, how important this old meeting house was, our meeting house, to the town of Boston and to the people of Massachusetts. And don't think for a minute, not for one minute, that those planning this grand procession, what with the white horses and the fusiliers and the gun blasts and the ceremonial clothing, the cheering crowds, don't think for a minute that Samuel Adams and Paul Revere and William Scully didn't mean to evoke and conjure the Bible. In fact, the very story from the book of Revelation just read by John. Don't think for a moment that they weren't intending a biblical suggestion, sacred ceremony of grandeur and majesty, the snorting white horses, the struggle with and defeat of evil overcome by good. In the case of the book of Revelation, the evil of Babylon. In the case of Boston, the great struggle against and in the end, the defeat of tyranny, the righteous defeat of king and crown. Now, if you know your Bible, and Adams and Revere and Scully, these stout Puritans, they knew their Bibles, you know that God is no lover of kings. This grand procession of July 4, 1795, commencing from this meeting house, is Boston's own version of the Hallelujah Chorus, a sacred celebration reveling in the alignment of the government on earth with the government in heaven. That was back when, when it was said of the Massachusetts State House and the Old South Meeting House that they were the Moses and the Aaron of New England. But let's move forward in time now, 66 years forward, just two and a half generations later, to the year 1861. Shortly after the inauguration of Abraham Lincoln as president, Confederate forces, secessionist forces, fire upon Fort Sumter in South Carolina. The secessionists advocate for states' rights and the privilege, they call it the freedom, the license, to uphold slavery. The attack upon Fort Sumter threatens the very fabric of this still young nation. In response to that opening volley of what would become the Civil War, a war for the Union, a war for the United States Constitution, and a war over whether some humans might be permitted the right to sell and own other humans. In response to the attack upon Fort Sumter and at the urging of Bostonians, a patriotic event is planned again, this time to be held here. It was natural, instinctive, that in response to such a crisis as now faced the Union, that the people of Boston would turn again to this very meeting house. What this meeting house had suffered before and during the American Revolution, and what this meeting house had achieved, and to what it had given voice, was still fresh in the historical memory of the town. Now in the spring of 1861, in the face of this new national emergency, this meeting house is looked to again to be a rallying point, a gathering place, a fixed center in a time of national dislocation and dismay. And so it is that 
the people of this meeting house make preparation. Men climb up into the steeple, bearing tools and lumber to hoist and secure a sturdy pole for a large American flag. And this is no small undertaking. They must fasten the flag's pole against the pull of wind and torque, secure bolts affix stays to brace and spread the pressure, string halyard and pulley. And because this inside of the meeting house could not possibly contain the expected crowds, they agree to hold the event outdoors right there and go to the trouble of erecting a platform by the front door. And then to top it all off, they hire Gilmore's band, led by Patrick Gilmore, the Patrick Gilmore, the renowned 19th century bandmaster, one of the most influential band conductors in American history, second only to John Philip Sousa. And by the way, as an historical note, Gilmore and his entire band would just five months later enlist themselves in the Civil War, enlist on behalf of the Union cause. 68 musicians, including 20 drummers, 12 buglers, would go to war with the 24th Massachusetts Voluntary Regiment. They not only played in camps, they would literally accompany the troops onto the battlefield. It would later be said of them that Gilmore's band incited soldiers to heroic deeds, did much to boost morale, and helped to win the war. So back to the story. The day arrives, May 1st, 1861. By high noon, the whole town and far beyond are gathered here. Men and boys by the thousands are out all over Washington Street. The windows of the church and the windows of the neighboring buildings are filled with the ladies. Upon the platform erected for the event are the standing committee of the Old South Society, along with the ministers and the officers of the church. And down below, right by the platform, out front, to set the mood, Gilmore's band. They are turned out in uniforms, all brass and plumed hats, trim buttons and epaulets. They strike up a rousing rendition of Hail Columbia, the de facto national anthem for most of the 19th century. This is followed by Washington's march. The event of this day is called, and I quote, exercises at the consecration of the flag of the Union. At 12 noon, George Homer, a member of the standing committee of this church, addresses the vast assembly as follows. I quote, We are about to throw to the breeze from yonder spire the dear old flag of our forefathers and to consecrate it with our prayers. Where better than on this, sac on this consecrated spot should the flag of the republic be seen and read by all? It seems to me, gentlemen, that the stability of our government for the first time since its existence is actually on trial. In this great contest between right and wrong, where shall the people of Boston stand? If the great problem of man's capacity for self-government fails here, where shall we look to see it more successfully carried out? End quote. At this, the flag on the steeple is unfurled amid the cheering crowd while the band plays Star Spangled Banner. Old South Church, allow me to ask you a question today. On this Sunday before our National Day of Thanksgiving, on this, the occasion of our 63rd annual return to this meeting house, why are you here today? Why come to this old relic of a building? A building we shed in 1872 as a snake sheds old skin out of which it has grown. Why come back? Why return here to offer to God our high thanksgiving? It is meet and right between election day and our national day of thanksgiving to pause and in this ancient house, to remember the grand struggles, the heroes and the heroines, 
the soldiers and the statesmen, the poets and the patriots, the preachers and the pundits, that wrenched from monarchy and from papacy freedom, equality, and self-rule. It was here, under God, and with the assistance of great men and women, men and women propelled by great ideas, it was here that our forebears proved that we, flawed though we humans are, could yet be trusted with self-government. It was from this meeting house that our forebears proved to the world that a church without a bishop and a state without a king is in fact a living possibility that an educated populace could prove itself worthy of self-government. 350 years after the founding of this church, 332 years after the founding of this nation, we remain committed to a rare and precious and fragile undertaking, a republic founded on the unlimited suffrage and God-ordained equality of all people, a state self-governed by an educated populace, the state measuring itself not by the size of its army, but by the brilliance of its constitution. And equally, we remain committed to this rare and precious and fragile thing, a church governed not by bishop, nor by ancient creed, nor by patriarchy, but by its own people's best understanding of God's call to us in each new day. Here is the spot where the whole marvelous enterprise began. This is the roof under which the Republic's first councils were held. Here in this house, the air still trembles with the fiery rhetoric of Otis, with the commanding pen of Adams. Up there yonder, Phyllis Wheatley listened, listened well and listened hard as white men thrilled to the word liberty, white men propounding on the tyranny of the king, all the while, in Phyllis's phrase, holding tyrannic sway over masses of enslaved people. But up there in these, our galleries, persons of African descent, both enslaved and free, all stolen from home and homeland and forced here against their will, learned from this pulpit the high art of rhetoric, soaring rhetoric in the service of freedom, and so challenged and forced white America to the full and true meaning of liberty for all, unlimited suffrage, and equality under God. Why here? Why bother? It is no small undertaking to pack up our music stands and coffee pots, our handbells and our waste baskets, our cookies and our offering plates, and haul them all the way across town to this relic and vestige. When we have a perfectly good meeting house sitting empty on Boylston Street right now, here's why. London has its palaces, its House of Parliament, and its tower. France, it's Chartres Cathedral, and Paris, the Arc de Triomphe. Athens, it's Acropolis. But it is here, in this town, and in this meeting house, that our forebears, black and white, rich and poor, male and female, slave and free, forged from high ideals the design for liberty, self-government, an educated populace, and equality. From this house and city, would issue, bit by bit, law by law, the slow challenge to and the dismantling of patriarchy, aristocracy, monarchy, white exceptionalism, as fundamentally ungodly. From this house and this city, bit by bit, year by year, war by war, law by law, would come free education to every person and the right to vote for every adult both in church and in state, and the right to legal defense, free speech, free press, and so much more. But as the years have reminded us, and as our forebears knew all too well, such liberty, such a thing as self-rule, the firm belief in the equality of all people, these are not and never will be once and for all over and done. We are humans. We are sinners. 
We adore power. Some crave power. We are liable to amass power. We are tribal, and we can be brutal. Tyranny will never be totally defeated. Tyranny is like the rats and cockroaches of Boston. It scuttles in through the smallest nooks and crannies, taking advantage of any tiny fissure or crevice. Tyranny guffaws and sneers at the proposition that God intended all people to be free and equal. Today, across the earth, the forces of totalitarianism, nationalisms, fascism, Nazism, forces that privilege the few over the many, are threatening democracies, and they always will. To be on guard against tyranny, to be vigilant in the hard work of democracy, requires everyday attention, the constant vigilance of all the people. Such is today the purpose of this ancient house, now a museum, a classroom of our republic. Every day it teaches the lessons of self-government, the power of an educated populace, the purposes of the rule of law. The necessity of wide participation in the wheels and the gears of democracy. So why do we come here? Why make this annual pilgrimage? We come here to wonder at the heroes and the heroines of the past, to give God thanks for them, to re be reminded how much they suffered, at what cost was this republic won, and at what cost will it be held? Each year on this Sunday before Thanksgiving, we undertake our own little grand procession from our new facility on Boylston Street to this old Puritan meeting house to remember here what our forebears fought for and what we continue to fight for: a better, nearer alignment of the government of earth with the government of heaven. Amen. <laughs>